Thank you, Mrs. Heinen. I'd like to, on behalf of the Reformed Witness Committee, thank everyone for coming this evening. We're going to begin by reading Psalm 1. It's found on the inside of your program. We'll read that psalm and we'll open with prayer. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsels of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Let's turn to God in prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, we thank thee for the privilege of being able to gather together in this evening, for the freedom thou hast given us to gather as like-minded believers, concerned about the truth of thy word, and thankful for the privilege of knowing that word, having the spirit in our hearts by which we are able to apply that word to our lives. We're thankful, Lord, for the privilege that thou hast given unto us to know the wonder of the Reformation, the truth of the scriptures established and set forth clearly by men whom thou didst raise up. And we're thankful that many years later, we as a church of Jesus Christ, as individual members, desire to be faithful to that word of God. And we thank thee for the opportunity to hear messages pertaining to it, that we might read it and study it. And we thank thee for faithful preaching that exposits it, for opportunities for Bible study. We're thankful for the rich heritage thou hast given us and for the word of God, which is our treasure. And as we open it in this evening, we pray thy blessing upon Professor Heisinger. May he bring that word to us in a manner that edifies and builds up thy people and thy church and gives glory and honor to thy name. We're thankful for thy covenant faithfulness as we see evident here in our midst. Families, generations, Lord, thou hast been good unto us and we stand in awe of thy faithfulness. We are sinners, we cling to the wonder of thy grace and thy goodness toward us in Jesus Christ and to the wonder of the salvation that is ours in him. We confess that sin, we are thankful for the forgiveness that is ours in Christ and we pray that thou will keep us from sin and cause that the activities of this evening might abound to the glory and honor of thy holy name. Watch over us now we pray and grant thy blessing for Jesus' sake, amen. We'll open our Psalters to number 65. Psalter number 65. And we sing the four stanzas.
We're thankful to have Professor Heising in our midst. I'll read the nice introduction that's provided in the back of the program. Professor Heisinga served as the pastor of Hope PRC in Redlands from 2011 to 2019. Last spring, he graduated from Calvin Theological Seminary with a master's in theology and is presently teaching at the Protestant Reformed Seminary as professor of dogmatics and Old Testament studies. He was appointed by Synod to replace Professor Kaminga, and they are just beginning year four of a five-year transition. He is married to Michelle, they have five children, ages 7 to 17, and they attend Granville Protestant Reformed Church. Professor Heisinger? Thank you, Reverend Brummel, and thanks to the Reform Witness Committee for the invitation to be here this evening. It is a delight to be in Classes West again, where I spent my ministry and to fellowship with you, the saints here, and I look forward to that on the Lord's Day, too. And good to see you this evening. The subject, the subject I've chosen for the lecture tonight concerns one element of the important decision of Synod 2018 regarding covenant theology. Synod 2018 was very important in the Protestant Reformed churches. It answered a very lengthy protest and in so doing gave to the churches some significant and extensive doctrinal explanations in the realm of covenant theology. There was a controversy between the relation between two things. On the one hand, our experience, our enjoyment of covenant fellowship with God, and on the other hand, our obedience, our life of good works according to the law of God. How do those two things relate? And Synod gave an answer. But Synod not only spoke in the negative, expressing what the truth is not, identifying what is false, what is the lie, and what is to be condemned, but very importantly, Synod said something positively. The Church of Jesus Christ must be built upon the positive truth, the whole positive truth of the Word of God. And when it came to our good works, our obedience, Synod said something positive. This was the Synod's summary statement in 2018. Quote, properly expressing the relationship between obedience as the necessary way of the covenant and the experience of covenant fellowship is we experience fellowship with God through faith, in parentheses, instrument. On the basis of what Christ has done, in parentheses, ground, and in the way of our obedience, in parentheses, way of conduct or manner of living, unquote. That was 2018. In 2019, a protest came to Synod arguing that Although the decision of Synod was not erroneous, and although the Synod used the language of Herman Huxma, the language is not distinctive enough. Not today. We need a better expression of the truth. We need different language. Well, Synod 2019 rejected that protest of Synod 2018 and upheld the truth of Synod 2018. So my lecture tonight deals with that last statement, that last element of that summary statement of Synod 2018. It's the simple, beautiful, positive, historic teaching of Herman Huxma and the Protestant Reformed Churches that we enjoy covenant fellowship with God in the way of our obedience. That teaching is not universally embraced. I'm sure probably most of you have heard various voices from the group that separated from the PRC and 
now curses her as the God and Christ and gospel despising great whore of Babylon who's building the kingdom of the Antichrist. Out of that group, there have been voices saying the Protestant Reformed churches teach that we enjoy covenant fellowship with God in the way of obedience. That's federal vision heresy. That's a denial of the gospel. That's the teaching of justification by faith and works. That's the teaching of salvation by law. That's a conditional covenant teaching that we become God's friends by or because of our obedience. That's the doctrine of man, man, man. My purpose tonight is not to interact with and engage with those stones that are hurled at the PRCA any more than David engaged with the stones that were hurled at him by Shimei according to the Lord's bidding. But my purpose tonight is to do something that I find very exciting and that is to bring, bring us to the Bible. Now controversy and schism are painful, they're very painful and especially painful for some families and even some marriages. But theologically, theologically, controversy is necessary and it's good and there's even something exciting about it because as God leads his church in the way of humility, God sharpens the understanding of the church and God gives a more fervent and focused study of the confessions and the scripture. And so we want to go to the scripture tonight. I have not mastered theology. You have not mastered theology. No one has mastered theology. We always need to learn. And thanks be to God for bringing us to the scriptures. So my purpose tonight is to honor the great legacy of the 16th century Reformation, wherein God used the reformers to bring the church back to the Bible. So let's go to the scriptures tonight. The topic of this lecture is not new. There have been other lectures between now and Synod 2018 on this subject. But I think there's more that can be said by the Protestant Reformed churches and especially in showing the biblical basis for this teaching, which is ours, that we enjoy covenant fellowship with God in the way of obedience. So the title of my lecture tonight is Synod 2018 and Holy Scripture, Enjoying Covenant Fellowship in the Way of Obedience. Let's begin with that concept of enjoying covenant fellowship. We're referring now to sweet communion the delightful and enjoyable experience of God's love, knowing God, enjoying God, having assurance, having his protection, his power, his nearness, his presence. God is our God. And to experience fellowship with him is sweetness to the soul so that we sing in Psalter 203 of sweet communion. And some churches conclude with their final doxology May the grace of Christ the Savior and the Father's boundless love with the Holy Spirit's favor rest upon us from above. Thus may we abide in union with each other and the Lord and possess in sweet communion joys which earth cannot afford. Sweet communion together as believers in sweet communion with God. Enjoying fellowship with God, which is sweet communion, is our life. This is perhaps the most beautiful expression of the Christian life, communion now, and one day it will be perfected in heaven when all of the interruption of our sin is over. Covenant fellowship is different than regeneration. Regeneration is a moment you are dead. Then God comes and he makes you alive in a moment, a once for all moment. 
Enjoying covenant fellowship is different than justification. Justification is the legal verdict that is rendered by the judge innocent. Enjoying covenant fellowship is different than the moment of regeneration or the declaration of justification. It's our life as it is eternally and forever in the Godhead of the triune God, life, covenant fellowship is our life. And scripture depicts that with the imagery of friends walking together. So that James 2.23 calls the believer like Abraham, the friend of God. And Genesis 5.24 says of Enoch, in Genesis 6 verse 9 says of Noah, both representing all believers, that they walked with God. And God promises in 2 Corinthians 6, verse 16, I will dwell in them, my people. I will dwell in them and walk in them. That is, I will walk in the midst of them, among them, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. So you can easily picture too, let's say Joseph and Mary in their marriage or Zechariah and Elizabeth in their marriage. They walk together as the best of friends. They open up their heart. They share their secrets. They commune with one another. That's love. That's the essence of the covenant. That sweet communion, fellowship. So we walk with God, our great friend sovereign. We know his secrets of love. They're revealed to us every week in the gospel and in the Holy Scriptures. We know the tokens of His love in the Holy Sacraments. We experience His presence and His protection. God is with us, enjoying sweet communion with God. To know Him and to enjoy Him forever. That's our life. The life of the covenant. Now it's amazing. Because God is so great and so glorious, and I'm very small, and you are very small, and besides, we're sinful. And this great God has fellowship with us. That's our life. I was sitting in the airport in Minneapolis on the way here this morning, watching all of the people walk by and wondered, kind of from an evangelistic point of view, so what's your life? And what's your life? And then you think of all these people in the life that they live, whatever it is, this is ours, enjoying covenant fellowship with God. Now, how does our obedience relate? First of all, our obedience is not the ground or the basis for our fellowship. Jesus Christ in his person and work is. Synod 2018 said, quote, we experience fellowship with God on the basis of what Christ has done. Ground, unquote. Jesus Christ, the incarnate Son of God with his lifelong obedience with his atoning death with his victorious resurrection he is our righteousness he has earned for us and all of the elect of God membership in God's covenant and every single blessing that there will ever be in that covenant through all time and into all eternity because of who he is and because of what he has done, he is the one mediator between God and sinners. He is the one who reconciles us unto God, brings us nigh unto God, so that in Christ we can live with our God and have fellowship with him. 1 Timothy 2 verse 5, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Jesus. Belgian Confession Article 23 says that we do not trust in anything in ourselves or in any merit of ours, relying and resting upon, here comes ground, here comes basis, relying and resting upon 
the obedience of Christ crucified alone, which becomes ours when we believe in him. This is sufficient to cover all our iniquities and to give us confidence in approaching to God. So we do not enjoy covenant fellowship with God because of our obedience. That is on the ground or the basis of our obedience. We do have sweet communion with God because of Christ who paid the penalty for all of our sins and who obtained perfect righteousness for us so that we have a way of access unto God. So if you ever want to thank and credit and praise someone for your covenant fellowship with God, do not look at yourself. Thank, give credit to, and praise your Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's because of him. Now let's start to draw a little picture here. We'll add more elements as we go along. So imagine God in heaven. Now I know God is omnipresent. God in heaven, you are on earth, and here's Jesus, the ground, the basis, his person, his work. Therefore, he is the mediator and the only one between God in heaven and you on earth. Now, we'll add more elements as we go. Not, our obedience is not the basis, the ground, the reason for. Second, our obedience is not the instrument through which we have fellowship with God. Faith is. Synod 2018 said, quote, we experience fellowship with God through faith, instrument, unquote. So in order for us to have and to enjoy covenant fellowship with God, God must perform a miracle. God must take us and unite us by an unbreakable bond to that one living mediator so that we become bone of his bones and flesh of his flesh. And God, through the means of the preaching of the gospel, must work within our heart a conscious faith so that we actually know Jesus and trust in Jesus. And then united to Jesus and believing in Jesus by the instrument of faith, we receive. We not only receive His righteousness, we receive His Spirit and all of the blessings that are stored up in Jesus Christ in heaven. We receive the sweetness of God's goodness. Faith is unique. Faith is the only instrument of reception. Repentance is not an instrument of reception. Our good works of of obedience are not an instrument of reception. There is nothing like faith. Faith is the instrument. And through faith, we receive. Believing, we receive. John 7, verse 39, But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. Galatians 3, verse 2, This only what I learn of you, received ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. Galatians 3, verse 14, That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Belgic Confession, Article 22, Faith is an instrument that keeps us in communion with him in all his benefits. And faith is only an instrument with which we embrace Christ, our righteousness. And the Holy Ghost kindleth in our hearts an upright faith which embraces Jesus Christ with all his merits. Back to the picture. God in heaven, you on earth, Jesus the mediator between God and you. Faith, 
is the vertical channel. Faith, the instrument by which you in your heart are connected to God through Jesus Christ. This vertical channel. And it's by believing in that you receive faith. Third, obedience is not the ground. Our obedience is not the ground, not the reason, not the cause. It's not the instrument. It is rather our way of conduct in covenant fellowship with God. So that as you walk through your life enjoying fellowship with God, you enjoy Him because of Christ. And you enjoy him through faith. And you enjoy him as you walk in the way of obedience. Synod 2018, quote, properly expressing the relationship between obedience as the necessary way of the covenant and the experience of covenant fellowship is we experience fellowship with God through faith, instrument, on the basis of what Christ has done, ground and in the way of our obedience, way of conduct or manner of living, unquote. Chosen by God, redeemed by Christ, renewed by the Spirit in God's covenant, we friends of God are quickened within unto obedience to God's law. Obedience is the way. Obedience is the path on which we walk. Obedience describes our grateful conduct in fellowship with God. It describes our manner of living. How will we who enjoy covenant fellowship with God live? In the way of obedience. I'm only quoting thus far Synod's summary. Synod said much more. For example, Synod taught, quote, Obedience is the life of the covenant. As God's justified and sanctified friend servants delight in walking in obedient friendship with their friend sovereign, to whom they are beholden for all the good works that they do and not he, to them, unquote, the path of obedience. Now, we could call that path other names. We could call it the way of the antithesis, the way of light, so that if you obey God, you will be different in the world and perhaps even in your own family. We could call it the way of suffering, if you obey God, you will suffer and bear a cross in this world, perhaps even in your own family. We could call it the narrow way. If you obey God, you will find yourself often on a very lonely and unpopular path. We could call it the way of sanctification. This, I believe, is the favorite designation of Herman Huxma, the one that I judge in his readings to be used most often. And I believe that to be the case because Huxma wants to underscore the fact that this path of obedience for us in this life is never a path of perfection. As Lord's Day 44 teaches, even the holiest men while in this life have only a small beginning of this obedience, yet so that with a sincere resolution, they begin to live, not only according to some, but all the commandments of God. And by calling this path of obedience the way of sanctification, that underscores the fact of the necessity for daily repentance and the ongoing mortification of the old man and the quickening of the new man by the power of the Spirit. 
Now, before we return to the picture we're drawing, it's important to underscore that sweet communion with God is not enjoyed by those who depart from the path of obedience and deliberately and impenitently walk in the way of disobedience. Synod said, quote, we do not experience covenant fellowship as we continue in disobedience. We experience covenant fellowship in the way of obedience, unquote. To be sure, the elect regenerated sinner who for a time stubbornly, wickedly persists in the way of sin, he remains in the state of grace. He remains united unbreakably to the Savior, and he will have a real and genuine experience of the love of God. But that experience is not one of sweet communion, enjoyable fellowship. It is the bitter an agonizing experience of God's heavy hand of chastisement. Hebrews 12 verse 11 says, Now no chastening for the present time seemeth joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, there's a sweet afterward, but before that sweet afterward, the experience is grievous. The experience of chastening is is miserable. When David walked impenitently in sin, he was not enjoying covenant fellowship with God. God was displeased, and God was breaking his bones one by one, so that David cried, My bones wax old through my roaring all the day long, for night and day thy hand was heavy upon me. My moisture is turned into the drought of summer. Psalm 32 verses 3 and 4. When Jonah deliberately walked in the way of disobedience and he would not turn, but he continued impenitently, Jonah did not experience fellowship with God, sweet communion with God, assurance of his salvation. God was displeased with Jonah, and God made that very plain by stirring up the sea around him and by casting him out of that ship into the midst of the sea where he sank all the way down. And out of the darkness, what did Jonah cry? Oh, how sweet the communion with my God. I am cast out of thy sight. Jonah 2. Verse 4. In fact, if you say, I enjoy covenant fellowship with God and the assurance of my salvation, while you deliberately walk in the way of disobedience, you are a liar. And we must say to you, repent, liar. 1 John 1, verse 6. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. To experience Jehovah's chastening hand as an impenitent elect sinner is to experience Jehovah's love. David experienced God's love, and so did Jonah. But the experience of that love is one of anguish and distress and bitterness of soul. It is not the experience of sweet communion with God. We enjoy covenant fellowship with God only in the way of obedience. So here's the picture now. God is in heaven. You are on earth. Jesus is the one and only living mediator between God and you on earth. 
Faith is the instrument that keeps you in communion with Christ. It's the vertical channel. And by believing, you receive the Spirit. And in principle, then you receive everything. And when you receive that Spirit, believing that Spirit makes your faith fruitful as you bring forth the fruits of good works of gratitude. And now those good works are the horizontal path under your feet and on which you walk. God, Christ, me, faith, think vertically, channel, obedience, the path that stretches out horizontally and runs through time all the way to the grave. And it's on that path that you walk. Now we have a picture, but let's turn it into a video and hit the play button and watch what happens. This is life. You are walking in sweet fellowship with your God through time, like Enoch, like Adam before him, like Abraham after him. God is your friend sovereign to whom you are united by faith in Jesus Christ and from whom you receive all good things. You walk in fellowship with God. That is your life. And as you walk with God, enjoying sweet communion with God who is in heaven, on what path do you walk? On the path of obedience. That path is not the basis. That path is not the ground. That path is not the reason. That path is no instrument for reception. That path describes the manner in which you conduct yourself while enjoying fellowship with God. This is how we live in fellowship with God, in grateful obedience. Because of what Christ has done, through the instrument of faith and in the way of obedience. Now, before we go to the scriptures, I want to conclude this explanation by calling your attention to two important distinctions, helpful distinctions made by past synods. First, Synod 2016 distinguished two uses of the word way in Scripture, quote, Sometimes in Scripture, the word way refers to the conduct or way of life of a person. And then examples from Scripture, unquote. Quote, other times in Scripture, the word way refers specifically to how we have access to the Father sometimes referred to as the objective basis of our salvation, which is the person and work of Jesus Christ. Hebrews 10, verse 20, unquote. Our obedience is not the meritorious way of access unto God. Vertical in our picture it's not how we come to God. We come to Him by faith in Christ. Obedience is the way of conduct. It describes our manner of living in our picture, the horizontal way. So Sid had made a distinction. Way of access, way of conduct. And then secondly, with exquisite precision, Synod 2018 called obedience the fruit of faith in fellowship or in the experience of fellowship. The protest that came to Synod 2019 wanted to jettison the phrase in the way of obedience. It was good for Huxma but it's not good enough today. Quote, I believe that it is important 
and would be helpful for synod to replace all such indistinctive language with distinctive language that clearly and consistently indicates that the only relationship between obedience and fellowship is that obedience is the inevitable fruit of experiencing fellowship with God by faith alone, unquote. And, quote, it must be clear that all of our obedience comes after as the inevitable fruit of our experience of covenant fellowship by faith, unquote. The Protestant said, obedience is the fruit of fellowship. It's the fruit of experiencing fellowship. It comes after the experience. Synod, 2018, quote, but obedience is the way of grateful conduct in the experience of covenant fellowship because obedience is a necessary fruit of our faith in Christ, through which faith we have fellowship with God. Unquote. Protestant, obedience is the fruit of fellowship. Synod, obedience is the fruit of faith in fellowship. Synod was essentially saying to the Protestant, your distinctiveness is your own personal distinctiveness. And you're trying to bind the churches where God will not bind the churches and lead the churches where God will not lead the churches. Our distinctiveness is the distinctiveness of the Reformed confessions. And there we will stand. And the confessions always teach that obedience, good works, are the fruit of faith. Insisting that obedience is the fruit of fellowship, that obedience always comes after the experience of fellowship, raises the question, is the believer's obedience ever a part of his life in fellowship with God as we walk in fellowship with God through time or is obedience always after always after always after but never in the experience of fellowship synod said obedience is the fruit of faith in the experience of fellowship, so that as you walk with God in fellowship, you are obeying God. We enjoy covenant fellowship with God in the way of obedience. Now let's go to the scriptures. I'm not going to stand here tonight and quote Protestant Reformed writers, theologians of the past. I do not exaggerate. I could take the entire time slot tonight and give quote after quote after quote to demonstrate the doctrine of Synod 2018 and the PRCA is the doctrine of Herman Hooksma and all of our fathers. In fact, a 10-year-old boy could do that. I'm not going to spend time in the confessions tonight, but I will call your attention to Canons Head 1, Article 8 which says God hath chosen us from eternity, both to grace and glory, to salvation and the way of salvation, which he hath ordained that we should walk therein. So according to the canons, there's salvation. There's the whole reality of salvation, the salvation that Jesus accomplished and the salvation that the Holy Spirit applies to the elect sinner. And applies all throughout his life, all the way unto his final glorification, salvation. But there's not only salvation, there is the way of salvation, the way of good works. In which way those who are saved walk so that they enjoy 
their salvation walking in the way of obedience. Canons 1.8. But let's go to the scriptures. Now there are specific passages like Proverbs 12 verse 28, which was quoted by Synod 2019. In the way of righteousness is life. And in the pathway thereof, there is no death. We could find some Proverbs and the express phrase in the way of obedience, but let's go past that simplistic approach and look elsewhere in the Scriptures. First, Scripture not only teaches that our life, as ordained by God, is walking in fellowship with Him. But Scripture teaches that our life, as ordained by God, is walking in obedience to Him. Psalm 119 repeatedly calls God's commandments His ways. And that term emphasizes that the whole course of our life, all the way to the grave, must be one of obedience to the commandments. That is the way. Exodus 18, verse 20. And thou shalt teach them ordinances and laws, and thou shalt show them the way wherein they must walk, and the work that they must do. In contrast to this way of obedience is, according to Psalm 1, the way of the ungodly and the way of the sinner who shall perish. Now, the verb that Scripture uses when it speaks of the way is the verb walk. And the verb walk emphasizes the entire ongoing active life of the believer. So that obedience is not a moment. Obedience is not something that is to be done on occasion. Obedience is not something for Sunday morning and Sunday evening. Obedience is not something for the public eye. Oh, they're watching me now? Now is time for obedience. Obedience is not like stepping stones and you hop from one to the next. Obedience is our entire life. So that even as walking in the way of disobedience does not refer to committing a sin here or there, but it refers to the whole character of one's life. He's walking in disobedience. So walking in the way of obedience refers to the whole ongoing active life of loving God and loving the neighbor walking in the way. Thus Ephesians 2 verse 10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them, not do them, walk in them. Obedience is the path of our life. It's been marked out, laid out by God from eternity. All those good works. So that God's purpose is not occasional obedience, but it's a life of obedience. Now, as we demonstrated earlier, Scripture teaches that our life, as ordained by God, is a life of walking in sweet communion with Him. And Scripture teaches that our life as ordained by God, is a life of walking in obedience to Him. So when we walk in covenant fellowship with God, on what path will we walk? The path of obedience. What will characterize our life in fellowship and sweet communion with God? Grateful obedience. The requirements of those who walk in fellowship with God are to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. Micah 6, verse 8. Second, there are a whole host of covenantal passages that bind together with an unbreakable tie 
enjoying God in the covenant and obeying God. We can find many of these passages in the book of Ezekiel, and that is not so surprising because, remember, Ezekiel is speaking to the captives in Babylon, the Jewish captives who for years and years were saying, we have fellowship with God. We have sweet communion with God. We give our sacrifices. We go to the temple. We have assurance of our salvation while they're worshiping idols and slaying the prophets, and they wake up, and they're in Babylon under God's heavy hand. And here comes Ezekiel, the prophet. Many passages. For example, chapter 36, verses 24 through 28. I'll read that one. I will not read chapter 11, 19 through 21. Chapter 37, 23 through 28. I will read Ezekiel 36, 24 through 28. And notice the sovereignty of God. I, I, I. 36, verse 24. For I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries and bring you into your own land. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you and ye shall be clean from all your unfilthiness And from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you. And a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh. And I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you. And cause you to walk in my statutes. And ye shall keep my judgments and do them. There is obedience. God says, I will cause you to walk in my statutes and ye shall keep my judgments and do them obedience. And, verse 28, ye shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers and ye shall be my people and I will be your God. There's the covenant. Verse 28, enjoying God as our God in the land. Who knows God as their God in the land of Canaan? Those who walk in obedience, who keep the statutes of God. Similarly, Jeremiah 7, verse 23, same context as Ezekiel. God says, this is what I taught your fathers long ago when I took them out of Egypt. But this thing commanded I them, saying, Obey my voice, and I will be your God. And ye shall be my people, and walk ye in all the ways that I have commanded you, that it may be well with you. What? A conditional covenant. You obey... And then, on the basis of that obedience, I will be your God in the covenant. No, no, I am your God. I brought you out of Egypt. I carried you through the wilderness. I brought you into my covenant. I brought you into the promised land. I am your God in the everlasting covenant. Now obey me. And it's only as you walk in that way of obedience that you will know me as your God and it will be well with you. Obey my voice and I will be your God. Remember the picture we drew. We walk with God. We enjoy him for Christ's sake. We receive everything, even the taste of his goodness, the experience of his love. We receive everything through the instrument of faith. And as we walk in the fruits of faith, the way of obedience, not in the way of iniquity. Finally, this is the doctrine of the Psalms. In fact, the Psalms begin here, very literally begin here. 
We read Psalm 1, verses 1 and 2. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Blessed, happy. Who's blessed? Who's happy? Well, of course, the man who's been justified freely. Who's blessed and happy? Well, the man who enjoys God as his God in the covenant, believing in Jesus by faith. But that's not what the psalm says. Of course it's true. The one who's been justified, the one who believes. But the psalm identifies the blessed and happy man according to his conduct, according to his manner of living. And the psalm makes plain, it is not the man who walks in the way of the ungodly that is blessed and happy. It's the man who walks in the way of delighting in the law of the Lord. The Psalms begin here with this inviolable principle of God in which he ties two things together that cannot be broken. The enjoyment of fellowship with him and walking in the way of obedience. We have blessing. We enjoy assurance. We know his favor in the way of obedience. Psalm 119 verse 1 is the same. Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. And we'll sing that versification in Psalter 428 at the conclusion and I hope you can sing with understanding and lustily. If anyone finds the teaching of Synod 2018 offensive and willfully rejects it, willfully and knowingly, I don't mean ignorantly because I understand there are people who are ignorant, they do not understand all the theology, they simply follow authoritative sounding voices. Those who willingly, knowingly reject this doctrine and condemn it as the heresy of the federal vision, that I would ask for honesty, please stop singing the Psalms because your Psalm singing is hypocrisy. Listen to Psalter 65, stanzas 3 and 4, which we sang tonight. Stanza 3. He who walks in godly fear, in the path of truth shall go. Peace shall be his portion here, and his sons all good shall know. As you walk in the way of obedience, you not only have God's blessing now, you may expect God's blessing in the future. You and your sons. Stanza four, they that fear and love the Lord. I can imagine that if someone preached this statement, it would be or it would have been protested as conditional theology. They that fear and love the Lord, that's the essence of obedience. They that fear and love the Lord shall Jehovah's friendship know. He will grace to them accord and his faithful covenant show. What's that? Conditional theology that you love God and then he takes you into his covenant and gives you the experience of his nearness? Who has ever imagined conditional theology when singing Psalm 65? We know the truth. We have always known the truth that we enjoy God's friendship, we enjoy God's blessing, we enjoy God's grace as we walk in the way of obedience. Psalter 278, verse 5, those who his gracious covenant keep, how do you keep his covenant? You love him and keep his commandments. Those who his gracious covenant keep, the Lord will ever bless Their children's children shall rejoice to see his righteousness. Whom does he bless? Those who walk in the way of obedience. 
because their obedience is the reason for that blessing? No. Christ's obedience obtained it is the reason for it. But this walk in obedience is the grateful response for all that God has given. And in that way, blessing. And off that path, you may not expect any blessing. You may not, you may not say, I have assurance of God's love as you continue in darkness. Fellowship with God in the way of obedience. This is Parenting 101. This is elementary. The Psalms begin here. The Israelites would teach their children doctrine by singing. And God teaches us doctrine by singing the Psalms. And this is where the Psalms begin. I'm not going to quote any Protestant Reformed ministers or theologians tonight. But I will quote one of our mothers. When Gertrude Huxma was teaching the lesson of Isaac, Rebecca, Esau, and Jacob living in that home with all that deceit and conniving and scheming and suspicion and lying, she taught the children, Rebecca should have said, well, now the quote, she could have gotten the whole family together and talked about being blessed by God only in the way of obedience. What godly mother has not trained their children in that way? That's the doctrine of the Huxmas. That's the doctrine of the PRCA. That's the doctrine of the Reformed faith. That's the doctrine of the Psalms. That's the doctrine of the Spirit. My last point tonight, I will be brief. Why is obedience the way? Number one, because God is holy. God is holy. God commands us to be holy. God makes us holy, and God delights in that work of His. God will not walk with you as a friend and give you the delightful experiences of His love while you walk in the way that He abhors. He hates the profanity and carelessness of antinomianism. We are not nearly as holy as our God is, but even we will not walk with a friend or even a family member who persists in the dark way of disobedience. God is holy, and he makes us holy. That's the way of life. Secondly, we enjoy covenant fellowship in the way of obedience. Why this way? Because God always makes faith fruitful. If you enjoy sweet communion with God, you have faith. It's impossible to have God as your God and know him as your God without faith. And if you have faith, the Holy Spirit will make your faith fruitful. It's impossible to have faith without having the fruits of faith. And therefore, a man who walks in fellowship with God by faith will love God, adore God, serve God, and love his neighbors for God's sake. To deny fellowship with God in the way of obedience is to deny that God is holy, to deny that God makes faith fruitful. Third, because God is a personal being. God does not have fellowship with rocks and tree stumps and dead people any more than we do. Fellowship presupposes more than one person. The covenant is a living relationship. And in that beautiful relationship, as you walk with God, God is loving you. He's loving you. 
And the fruit of God's love is that you love him. He loves you and you love him. And there's this continual dynamic of fellowship in the mutual bonds of love. And all that activity is inscribed in God's sovereignty so that it's all of God and it's all through God and it's all to God to whom be glory forever and ever, Romans eleven thirty six. To deny fellowship with God in the way of obedience is to deny God as a personal God. Finally, because God seeks his own glory. Why is this the way? Because God seeks his glory. The purpose of God in saving us and incorporating us into his covenant by a wonder of grace is that he might consecrate us unto himself so that we render grateful returns of ardent love to God. Why? Because as we walk in this hostile world that hates God, it's this life of obedience, this life of consecration to God that manifests we belong to his covenant, that we are God's party in the world, that we stand for God's cause and we live for God's truth and all of it to the glory of God's name. Even as God sends the rain down from heaven, to water the earth, to cause it to bring forth and to bud, Isaiah 55, verse 10. So God sends his word down from heaven to his covenant people, and it never returns void, but it always accomplishes its purpose, Isaiah 55, verse 11. And God's purpose is that we not only know him and enjoy him in the covenant, but that we bring forth the good works, the fruits of thanksgiving, the budding the budding of fruit to the praise of his glorious grace through all time and into all eternity. After all, all things are not only of God and through God, but to God. So he consecrates us unto himself and lives with us in sweet communion and gives us his grace so that we walk in that way of obedience. Now, I do not want this to be theoretical. Of course, it's very important, it's necessary and good that we get all our doctrine lined up just right according to the confessions in the scriptures. But are you living this life, fellowship with God in the way of obedience? You. Don't minimize holiness, godliness, and the spirit. Our world is so, so wicked, and every week it becomes more and more wicked. When I talk to the young people going off to college, the public universities, and they tell me day one, let's take five minutes, says the professor. Let's go around the room. Tell us your name, where you're from, and your major. And how many students are now speaking in the college classroom, identifying by a sex other than their own biological sex, and telling the class, these are my pronouns that I want to be, you to use for me. That's in the college classroom, that's at McDonald's, that's in the workplace. This world is so wicked, and wickedness comes into the church. And there can be found great wickedness even in God's church, even in our churches. And there's wickedness in my own soul and in your own soul. And sometimes we fight each other. That's wicked. We squabble and we fight and we argue. 
Soldiers marching in the same column, and we don't target the enemy out there. Sometimes we put a target on our brother or sister in the church, and we oppose one another. That's wicked. There's wickedness everywhere. If you're not living this life, repent. Repent tonight. Stop. And go to the cross by faith. Find forgiveness in the Lord Jesus Christ and the resolve to walk in a new and godly life. Do not live as a hypocrite. And friends and believers, children of God, we struggle, we live the Christian life, we bear all these heavy burdens. We're discouraged because we're Our life doesn't show the holiness we would like. We're so often unfaithful. Keep clinging to the promise of God. And the promise of God is, I will be your God. That's it. And that's everything. If God is your God, then everything is for you now and forever. I will be your God. So keep looking up. Behold your God. Cling to him by faith. Walk with him in sweet fellowship. Go to his word. Live in the way that is pleasing to him and be happy. I hope you're happy no matter what happens. Here, there, anywhere. I hope you're happy. I'm happy. Happy is that people whose God is the Lord. And happy is that man who walks in the way of delighting in the law of the Lord. May God make us happy in his covenant. Thank you for your attention tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Heisiger, for that beautiful speech. After singing Psalter 428, I'd like to ask Reverend Lang to come up and close in prayer, and then we'll, you're all welcome for refreshments and fellowship afterwards. So uh, shall we now sing from Psalter 428? Let's rise and sing, shall we? This beautiful Psalter, singing verses 1, 5, and 8 of Psalter 428.
go to our God in prayer. O oh Lord, our God and our Father, it is a joy, O oh Lord, that we have in our heart knowing Thee to be our God, to have fellowship with Thee. Thou hast revealed Thyself unto us in Jesus Christ, and we are so thankful for the gift of faith. We confess, O oh Lord, that we were dead and thou didst raise us to life. Thou didst give to us faith, faith that we know our Lord Jesus Christ purchased for us. And we are so thankful for his perfect sacrifice. We are so thankful, O oh Lord, that we do have fellowship with thee. We marvel. Thou hast shown us mercy. Such sinners we are, saved by grace. We are so thankful for thy blessings upon us and upon our children in the line of generations, that our children have fellowship with thee, that they know thee to be their God, their Father. For that we give thee thanks. Lord, forgive our sins and deliver us from evil. Grant us strength in these dark days to magnify thy name. That is our desire. We love thee, O Lord our God. We want to glorify thee. And as there are many that assault us and assault our children night and day, we need the strength that comes from thee. Lord, grant that strength to us and to our children, and may we magnify thy name and encourage one another. We are so thankful for the communion of the saints. Be with us now and the rest of this night. We're thankful for the time that we've had together, thankful for the word we have heard, and we ask that our fellowship tonight may be to thy honor. Guide us also in our homeward way. And may that gospel of truth go forth to the nations, that thy people may be gathered, and that thy name may be praised. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. <laughs>